One of the biggest questions to ever be pondered by humans is this. Do humans have free will? If you look in the online space, what do you find? You find people like Sam Harris and Sapolsky saying that free will is an illusion. Well, the question we are going to answer today is, is that actually true? Is free will an illusion, or do we genuinely have free will, and are they missing things in their arguments? Well, today I sat down with David Lawrence, who wrote an entire book on this topic, for another episode of Universe of Game here, and it's one of my favorite when it comes to a specific topic in understanding the intricate details of arguments. This is it. So if you ever really wanted to come to the conclusion of whether we have free will or not, and are they saying the truth when they're saying free will is an illusion— this is the intricate podcast for that. If you want to listen to a specific part of the arguments that they make and how he talks about the nuances of them, you can check out the timestamps in the description. Otherwise, let's get into today's podcast with David Lawrence. Also, last thing before we begin is if you notice that David's voice sounds robotic or AIE, it's because we had to use a software to remove a lot of the background noise, and that was a result, but it was it's it's way better than it was, trust me. So if you're hearing that, that's why that's happening. All right, let's get into it. <laughs> right, you go on YouTube, and it's, it seems like everybody's saying, no, you don't have any free will. And... I would just love to explore this topic more with you and, um, you know, kind of starting at the beginning of what your definition of free will and determinism is, and then maybe going into your thoughts on kind of Sam Harris, because I, so many people, he's popular in the free will, and he's like, no, we don't have it. So I'd love to hear and, your thoughts on that. Sure. Well, free will is the ability to um, form intentions, to make choices, to take actions, and, and to take actions that influence the world, a reality that's capable of being influenced. Pretty much what common sense says it is. Now, there's a lot of different definitions in the, in the trade of the debate, but we could put those aside for a second. And, uh, and Harris does a very good job of, of debunking all those other definitions. Um, and then determinism is the idea that we're uh, everything that happens, everything we do, everything you think is it, it is attributable to a chain, a chain of causes, a chain of physical causes that go back to the Big Bang. And at the Big Bang, this set of cosmic dominoes were started and it ascends all the way down to this moment. And everything that we think and do uh, is predestined, was all meant to happen. We have no say over it. It's in the hands of third parties. Mm -hmm. So everything that we're experiencing and doing, this is all mechanical byproducts of these unthinking, that's important point, unthinking physical forces that came from the Big Bang. Nick, interruption. You're, you're wobbling and freezing on my screen. Um, that's okay. Yeah, it'll, it's fine in the background. It does that while we're recording. But Oh, okay, mm -hmm. good. So, yeah. Fred, I was losing you there. No, you're um, good. <laughs> So that's the definition of uh, determinism. Okay. Interesting. So now with that definition, where do you think your, I don't know, I wouldn't say qualm. I, I think we chatted a bit before this and you said, you know, you actually like Sam Harris, but where do you feel like your perspective differs compared to what we see online in the no free will community? Well, Sam Harris is just representative of mainstream determinist or mainstream anti-free will talk or positions. There's nothing really special about his approach. It's very articulate, and it's out there in you know, some big popular format, so it's a good springing board. But what I say is not really contrary to his position. It's contrary to the determinist or anti-free will position. Um, and And... That's based on, um, I would say, about a half a dozen just fundamental misconceptions on which determinism is based. Um, and most of those misconceptions aren't talked about. Uh, so the debate is like over here in 20, 25% of what should be talked about, but it's missing a huge component. And that applies to Harris and it applies to to all the rest of the players, inclu including the compatibilists, um, which is the idea that, that, that free will and determinism can coexist, which is a nonsensical idea, which, as I say, Harris does a great job of debunking in a, in a chapter 
uh, in his book. Uh, so um, uh, those misconceptions apply to well, compatibilists, most of them as well as determinists. Um, perhaps the biggest misconception has to do with science. I mean, you hear people saying all the time things like, oh, well, you know, science has dismissed free will, or, oh, determine, uh, uh, science proves that determinism is what governs the universe. Whereas one a popular physicist who has a podcast says, if you go against determinism, you're going against science. And all of those claims are nonsense. And anybody who knows the state of science knows that they're nonsense. I mean, you have quantum physics, the most advanced science there is, and it's stuck between two narratives, right? I mean, the universe evolves deterministically in wave-like fashion. It's governed by the Schrodinger equation, the differential equation governing this deterministic evolution. The universe is deterministic. There's no free will. If we're determined, there's no free will. On the other hand, the second you rip open the box and you say, what's going on inside that? deterministic system, whoa, there are no waves. Waves have all vanished. All you see is particles, and they bump into each other and behave probabilistically, which permits the possibility of free will's existence. So for over 100 years, uh, since its inception, physicists have been trying to figure out what's sometimes called the measurement problem or the wave-particle duality. What the hell is this all about? Is the universe waves or particles or strings or... Uh, quantum fields or fairy dust, whatever you want to say, and the answer is science doesn't know. So pull back a second, take a bigger snapshot, okay, of the state of physics. There's about 20 or 30 theories about quantum physics. There's no one quantum physics. There's no one theory. There's no one accepted version about which is any kind of consensus. And all of these 30 Theories are all over the place. They disagree with each other on everything. I mean, they have different mathematics. They have different formal structures. They predict different outcomes. And most of all, they, they have very different things they say about reality. So then take the top, well, I won't say top, I'll say the most discussed three, okay? Pilot wave theory and the many worlds theory, and the GRW spontaneous collapse theories or family of collapse theories. Of those, the most talked about, two of them are deterministic, one is probabilistic. Two of them appear to preclude free will. One of them says, no, 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 free will's possible. And then you take the next circle out of six or seven, they're all over the place. So this is the fundamental misconception. The next person who says to you, oh, well, come on, there's no free will. Science is determined that there's no free will. Uh, know that that person isn't saying anything about the state of science. What they're telling you is their preferred interpretation of a scientific theory that's unresolved and about which there's no consensus. And I don't think any physicist would dispute this. Physics doesn't know how to solve the problem. It doesn't know what the universe consists of. And by the way, if we don't know what matter is, whether it's strings or particles and blah, 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 how do we know what, this is what causation, the pillar of determinism, is supposed to be operated on. It's what it's supposed to be governing. It's supposed to be what it's working through. So how do we know, uh, if we don't know what it is it's supposed to be governing, how do we know whether it's governing at all or what the hell it is? I mean, it's like getting into a car and turning on the keys and you don't know where the road is yet. You know, it, 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 it's, it's so backwards. So... So that's the first misconception. And what do you think the second one is? <laughs> well, I'm glad you asked. Um, well, let's stick with science for a second. Um, there's a sort of a bigger picture misconception about science that, that, that's somewhat astounding when you think about it. The free will question has a context. It's not just sitting out there alone. Do we have free will? There's, there's, it's only one of a dozen major cosmic mysteries. And most of them are far more fundamental than the free will question. If you have to answer, you have to answer those other questions before you can answer the free will question. Science doesn't know how the universe began. 
if it began, maybe the Big Bang, maybe not, there's other theories. It doesn't know why it's exponentially expanding. Is dark matter, dark energy real? Some say yes, some say no. Some say it's a placeholder. We've never seen it. Nobody knows what elements from the standard model it's comprised of. Okay, don't know why the universe is expanding, which, by the way, was just discovered, sorry, exponentially expanding. It was just discovered like 30 years ago. Before then, physics didn't know on a big scale what the universe was doing. Okay? Um, as I say, we, we, we don't know uh, wave-particle duality. We don't know matter, what the universe is made of. We don't know why quantum physics conflicts with um, quant uh, relativity theory. There's two conflicting laws of physics that we have. So whenever was, the laws of physics say this, well, wait a second, we have two conflicting laws of physics, and we need another law of physics, which we don't have, to resolve them. String theory has been trying to resolve this stuff for over 50 years, didn't get anywhere. A hundred years, this problem is, has been around or since, since, uh, since nine, the 1915 uh, uh, or so was Einstein's second uh, a theory of relativity, the general. Um, so 100 years, 50 years, don't know the answer to this problem. We don't know how life arose from matter. We don't know how consciousness arose from life. We don't even know what the fundamental nature of consciousness is. It's trendy to call it the hard problem of consciousness. We don't know what consciousness is or how experience arises or how experience could interface with physical events and, and to what extent it fits in or is a the hard problem of consciousness. Nobody knows. Determinists admit this. Harris admits, he says somewhere, that, that consciousness is the fundamental cosmic mystery. Okay, well, then how can anyone purport to have the answer to the free will question if you don't even know the nature of what it's supposed to be, or not be, the fundamental attributes, free will? So, so it's it's... Saying that you have the answer to the free will question, whether it's this or that, free will, not free will, whatever, is saying that you can leapfrog over what is life, what is the universe, what happened to the Big Bang to set up the conditions that followed. Um, what, it's leapfrogging over a dozen fundamental cosmic issues that are more fundamental than the free will question. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it always boggled my mind how how much certainty there was in some of these arguments. You know, well, uh, they can be as certain as they want, but ask a quantum scientist what quantum science means and whether the universe is probabilistic or deterministic. If it precludes free will or permits it, and they will ultimately say um, it's an open question. Quantum science hasn't figured that out yet. There's great minds on both sides. The other uh, interesting, I think, scientific problem that determinists don't talk about is, is it's related to science. It is sort of an emergent kind of a problem. It's that if we really are governed by physical events, what are they? I mean, what are we talking about? We're talking about unthinking insentient, non-living, physical things, bouncing around and doing what physical things do under the laws of physics. Whatever you take those laws to be, provisionally. Now, how could, how is it that those unthinking physical things could form patterns based on meaning and concepts and conceptual frameworks and interrelated ideas. I mean, there's no such thing in the world of unthinking physical events. There's no such thing that governs physical events under the laws of physics. Physical events don't know what concepts are. They don't know what language is, and yet somehow they're, they're, they're forming these patterns. What, by chance? You know, by the monkey in the library typing out Shakespeare after enough time? Because they keep typing it out in this case. And language and syntax, they're interrelated based on ideas. They're based on things that, that unthinking physical events don't know anything about and which aren't part of the laws of physics. So how did that happen? Why would they form that way? 
Do they know the rules of logic and concepts? They seem to have to if that's what they're perpetuating. That, 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 to me, that's however you come out on the free will issue, you have to deal with how basic, raw, unthinking forces are creating interrelated conceptual frameworks, forces that don't even know what a thought is. They don't know what language is. Are you saying what when when you say that? What are you referring to? What force? Co well, causal forces, the physical events in the causal chain mm -hmm. that determine, us, say, govern our thoughts. Okay. These physical events. How's that happening? I think at the very least, determinists owe an explanation, and it's not enough to say, "Well, that's just what physical events are doing." That's a, Really? Why are they doing that? And how could they do that if it's based on meaning and they don't know anything about meaning? Hmm, that's interesting. So, one of the questions that I found you won't hear Eris talking about that. I mean, you won't hear mainstream. That? You won't hear mainstream determinists talk about this stuff. Yeah, and there's an, another interesting thing that you've said that I found really interesting is that, from my understanding you're saying that morality can't exist in a universe without free will. And could I would like to go into that for sure. And one of my cats certainly wants to go into it as well. <laughs> well, it's one of the most important reasons that the, the, the free will question has some significance, which is that in a determined world, there is no personal responsibility and there is no morality. They don't exist. You can't be responsible for events you don't control. You don't control your own actions. If you can't prevent them, in what sense are you responsible for them? You have nothing to do with them. They're dictated by physical causes. What does responsibility mean? Now, determinists have all kinds of fancy ways of dancing around this. Harris has his, others have theirs. But the bottom line is, you can't be responsible for actions that you don't control or can't prevent. Under determinism, you're no more responsible for your own actions than mine. And I'm no, respons no more responsible for uh, Donald Trump's actions than mine because I'm equally not in control of either. And that's just what determinism says. It says that your thoughts and actions are caused by physical events in this causal chain. So what I'm saying is an interpretation. That's what determinism says. And similarly, if we don't control our thoughts, then what we believe about morality, good and bad, right, wrong, evil, sacred, all of that stuff are, are compelled thoughts, experiences that are put into our heads that are byproducts of physical causal forces. We don't believe in morality because it's true or because it's based on moral beliefs under determinism all of your beliefs are attributable to one thing and one thing only unthinking causal events there's no moral truth what you think is moral truth what i think is moral truth under determinism is simply byproducts passive byproducts of unthinking physical causes so how can you have morality Okay, and, so, and one one of the the most honest determinists uh, is 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 Robert Sapolsky, who's coming out with a a big book on determinism next week, and he he is one of the few who are honest enough to say that wait a second, you just can't have personal responsibility if you don't control your actions if they come from your genes and your synapses and your this and that in your biology, uh, which is his focal point for, for the physical causes that determine us. And he struggles with that in his discussions about not having free will and how you can justify morality. And he honestly says it's, it's quite difficult. Harris, to his credit, also does. I mean, he says it's very hard to justify morality and personal responsibility if you don't control anything you do. And he's right, it is hard, because you can't. <laughs> it's an understatement. You can't do it. You can only do it by playing games with, or, or lapsing into pseudo-utilitarian explanations that don't make any sense if we're, if we're determined robots. You know, one top physicist says, um, well, you know, there's, um, 
he's a compatibilist. He says, um, well, you know, there's this physical story, what the molecules and leptons and quarks are doing in our body and all that, in this physical sequences. And then there's the human story. You know, I picked the shirt, cut that color shirt because of motivations and interests, desires, background associations, blah, blah, blah. Have an important meeting, etc. And that's the human story. Oh, uh, hey. And that was a discordant story. Hey, Daisy. <laughs> um, so, but the point is that those, those, those vocabularies, right? The human story, the physical story, they don't conflict. But what they're describing conflicts because it's one or the other. I mean, either we live in a me mechanistic world and our thoughts and actions are determined and our choice of the shirts or the color shirts is a byproduct of causal forces or there's a human story in which we have motivations that, and, and that have some significance intentions that are ours, not just causal effects, but intentions. And then you can say the, the human story is real. But if you're going to avoid the conflict by saying, oh, there's two stories, and this physicist goes on to say, and we use whichever story is convenient. Well, hold on a second. Who's using it? This is this pseudo-utilitarian thing, which isn't possible in causal reality. So wait a second. Where did you leave causal reality such that we can now use things? Because that requires choice and intentions and prerogatives of the very thing that your physical story says don't exist. This is where Sapolsky, I think, is just cuts right to it. It says, come on, it's one or the other. And I and I and it's that's clearly the case. So that's the problem with responsibility and morality. It's simple. You don't have it. You know, you don't choose your moral thoughts. There is no moral truth except for what causal forces make you believe our moral truth. So there is no personal responsibility because all your actions are attributable to unthinking causal forces. Hey, real quick, if you're enjoying this podcast and you're getting value from it and you want to easily support it, I would really appreciate if you're on YouTube just hitting like and maybe dropping a comment and saying what you feel about the episode. That would be amazing. And if you're listening on Spotify or Apple Podcasts, just drop in a little five-star review while you're listening to the episode. That means so much to me, and I would really appreciate it. So thank you. We'll get back to it now. And that's in a, a deterministic universe. Okay. So just here's a, here's a question for you. Could morality, this is just, <laughs> just having fun here. Could morality exist in a deterministic universe if it was pre-programmed in to all causal relationships? And so it exists, but we might not even be able to recognize it. Is that possible? Well, you're assuming now we are in a fully determined world, a fully mechanical world. Our thoughts are given to us by physical events. Our beliefs mm -hmm. are attributable to physical forces. Well, yeah. so, so what is there besides pre-programmed thoughts? How, we would e how would we even know in your hypothetical that we were programmed in some way? We couldn't know that because that's just another belief that physical forces give us convictions in. Um, uh, and yeah. who would be doing that programming? And what would the, be the basis or the foundation for their moral programming to put it into us? Yeah, I think what you're saying is like, for reasons, it could not. But maybe actually more of what you're saying is like, there could be, it couldn't be possible because of these reasons. But what if it was because of the probability that it could actually happen just based on, uh, let's just say, numbers that a pro if you were to say there's an infinite amount of let's take the many worlds interpretation if there's an infinite amount of universes and worlds then there would be one that morality is pre-programmed in a deterministic world <laughs> yes yes i mean uh, it, 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 it's so absurd that the, the theory is so absurd that you, there must be many many worlds in which the many worlds theory is completely ridiculous and false <laughs> yeah. And it may turn out to be ridiculous and false in ours too, but we're, we're not yet at the point that scientists can declare that. Um, yeah, I mean, you have to, I guess you have to believe in the many worlds theory and you have to believe that every possibility manifests in some, I mean, I don't know how much your listeners know about it, but the, the, We've the talked many, about it, yeah. very, have you? Mm -hmm. 
So for those who didn't tune in, it solves the measurement problem, the conversion, if you will, in quotes from wave to particle by saying there is no conversion. What happens upon every measurement and observation is reality branches into millions of worlds and every possible outcome is actually comes true in those worlds. So it keeps on rolling forward deterministically. Doesn't say how it branches and what the, the mechanism behind that, all of that stuff, which is a big problem. And has a problem with dealing with probabilities and other things. But, but basically, we're constantly, I think it, they say uh, 5,000 times per second per individual, we're creating millions of worlds. Wow, that's a, that's a lot of underwear, you know, that's, that's a lot of cleaning detergent. Um, but <laughs> yeah, so, 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 yeah, I guess every, anything's possible if you want to say anything's possible in a, in a world, but how? But I get what you're saying, though. It makes I'm sense. I'm in the camp of, I would, somebody, a scientist said it's the most preposterous theory ever proposed, and I, I guess I'm, I would say I'm in that camp. It's so blatantly preposterous. Which one do you think is less preposterous? Well, the pilot wave theory, which is a deterministic theory, and the GRW theory, but, but there's problems with those. I mean, you pick the most preposterous one, sure. There's moral truth in those worlds. Sure, many worlds <laughs> is the most ridiculous idea in, in, in other billions of worlds. Um, and how do you ever prove that? Um, uh, yeah, I think the, the point was more to be like, it is potentially possible within the confines of an infinite universe or infinite universes. But um, more, more it was like, um, you know, you were asking a lot of questions of, who programmed it and i i guess the supposition there would be that it could be programmed in from the big bang uh, i mean there's a lot of people that would argue god right and sam harris does not like those people <laughs> uh how do you how are your views i mean you've got to at least have thought about god or a creator in this you know as you've ventured on into free will how do you feel like that does it fit in does it not fit in well if you're a determinist um, like Harris, what you should say is that my beliefs about God or the lack of God is whatever I was pre-programmed to believe at the Big Bang, because I don't, I'm not, I don't control my beliefs. I don't have any say in what they are. So any determinist who wants to talk about God or almost any other subject would, if they want to be consistent with determinist doctrine, would have to say that. Now I'm not a determinist, so I don't have to say that. Um, I, I've, I've never been a, a spiritual person. I wasn't raised in that tradition. And I, I, I guess you could call me a, a provisional member of, of Harris's uh, new atheist club. But um, uh, that's that personally, I don't think that that really um, impacts how I or others. Well, for some people, it impacts how they think about the free will question because God gave us free will according to to certain theologies. But I, I don't think it's a factor in um, in my thinking about the subject. Do you just feel like because it's not relevant or provable? Determinism? Or God in the equation of free will? In the equation of free will? Yeah, I'm just saying, do you feel like it's not relevant to you because it's not provable? Like, is that how you're determining whether it's relevant? That's a good question. Um, I suppose I have a fundamentally scientific bent in me, which precludes me from getting too invested in things for which there's very little empirical proof or none. It's, 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 I, I, uh, uh, I understand that in a sense, the question of God or any spiritual thing is, is beyond empirical proof by definition from the get go. But my own personal inclinations were from an, uh, a tradition in which there was a more empirical orientation. And there was no, uh, I wasn't raised with any kind of religious practice or anything like that. I see. I think it's kind of ironic. You're, you see, the shirt you have on is it says peace and love. And those things are unprovable. And a scientist has that on. What, what's going on there? <laughs> 
You know? Well, I didn't know about that. Robert Sapolsky would say, no, 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 they're very provable. They're, they're, they're human behaviors and social behavior, and we can chart them out, and we can take a look at what hormones are most active during you know, love and peace and this and that and the other thing. I think that's a little bit different than the order of you know, God. And, and, and also it comes down to, I, it's probably the first thing I should have said, is it depends on what you mean by God, you know? Mm-hmm. There's mm-hmm. people very different meanings of that from, you know, Santa Claus guy in the sky who's directing everything to an organic soul of the universe and Gaia kind of stuff. I mean, there's a lot of different versions of 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 God. Right. So I know that this isn't provable, but I'm just curious as to kind of your personal take on the beginning or creation of the universe and how that happened. Um I mean, there is obviously nothing provable, but I'm just really curious to hear what your thoughts are. I don't know. I mean, I would look to science for that, and science doesn't know. But what do you think? I know we don't know, but what's... Yeah, I don't... What, well, I don't... I, I think that it's a matter of evidence, and that's my empirical bent or non-spiritual bent. I think it's a matter of evidence. I mean, at some point, science could, could come up with, with definitive evidence that here's what happened. And maybe they never will. Right now, there's a couple or two or three or four theories about what happened, and there's theories that it, it was never born. It always was. So, so um, that's, that's my point to say, wait a second. It's a scientific question. Um, let science figure out what it is. And that is a, a, obviously a non-spiritual a sort of way of looking at things. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Okay. So... Why do you think it matters whether we have free will or not? Well, one of them was the moral point that we talked about earlier. If we don't have free will, there's no morality or personal responsibility. Those are, those are important things to want to preserve, certainly in the absence of any proof either way, let's say, to be agnostic about it. The other thing is it's, it's, it goes, it's, it's, it's who we are. I mean, it's, 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 the question is answering who we are. Because no matter who you think you are, and no matter how you label yourself, you know, determinist free will or otherwise, you go through your life, everybody does, based on having free will. At every moment of your lives, you affirm your conviction in free will. That's how you act. Um, so if you take that away, what do you got? I mean, no personal identity, there's no goals you can strive for, you don't control your actions, you can't achieve anything. It takes away what we fundamentally experience about ourselves every moment of the day. Now, that doesn't mean that truth has to be beautiful or what it, we want it to be, but there's all kinds of reasons why the world isn't deterministic. We've talked about one or two of the scientific ones. So in the absence of, of a definitive answer or anything near it, and you can disqualify one or two of the candidates that, that rule out free will, why would you, why would you go that route? I mean, the other, the other reason uh, it's important besides morality, and maybe this is just saying what I just said uh, uh, in reverse, is that determinism or not having free will is a philosophy of disempowerment. I mean, you don't have any control of anything. You don't control your thoughts. You don't control your actions. You can't influence others. You can't do anything in the world. It's all predestined. I mean, we're complete victims. We're perpetual and utter victims to physical forces. And when you say you in that, it is bleak. Yeah. I meant you, I meant you alone, Nick. Yeah. So what is, what is Nick in, in that argument? When you I know? meant you, I, I meant the figurative you of everybody, you know. Okay. We're all, we are all perpetual victims. If everything we think and do is caused by uh, physical events, how can we achieve anything? It's already been determined. You're going to achieve it or you're not going to achieve it. How can you have goals? I mean, you can have them, but they're, they're compelled thoughts that you didn't put into your head. This is what determinist doctrine is. So in your worldview, what do you see the you as or like the I? Like if, it, if we do have free will, what is the I that has free will? Uh, would be consciousness, which is okay. the big cosmic mystery besides matter and everything else about the universe 
Um, mm-hmm. uh, it would be consciousness. It would be a, a force that's not physical that we don't understand yet. Uh, that is capable by a mechanism that we don't understand yet to influence physical events. And ultimately, I, I think there will be a paradigm that gives us a better answer or an answer, since we don't have one at all, uh, in the current paradigm that will have to have another category of relations. It just can't be physical and mental and body and soul and you know volitional and causal and probable. You know, We have this very narrow categories and that's all we have within our conceptual framework and it makes the most sense to me that the answer can't be found in our current framework the current framework for over 100 years can't reconcile the two laws of physics and 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 doesn't know the nature of matter or the nature of consciousness okay it's going to take another paradigm it seems obvious to me to solve the wave particle problem to integrate relativity and quantum theory, it can't be done in this paradigm. The best minds have been trying to do it for over a century, and the free will question has been around for over two millennia. So so I, I, I think that it's not uh, an answer that is going to be found until that new you know, paradigm of reality and, and new relations between events that just we can't conceive of how to describe them currently. And that, that, that in that paradigm... You know, there will be a way in which something that's not purely physical in consciousness, but is totally within the laws of physics. You know, uh, it's it's another one of these misconceptions, not worth spending a lot of time on. But 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 um, you know, the idea that free will would violate the laws of physics, which is sort of another form of what we were grappling with earlier. We don't know what the final laws of physics. We know very little about the laws of physics. We know a lot within a small range of things. And by the way, it's nothing scientists don't say. I mean, they're always talking about the, the acclaimed scientists or any note are always talking about how incomplete the laws of physics are. Well, clearly they are, given all those cosmic mysteries I talked about. Um, but um, there you have it. I mean... You know, mm-hmm. now, I don't think it's going to work in this paradigm. It hasn't. And when you say this paradigm, what are you specifically referring to? Well, I'm referring to a paradigm which limits the, def, def, defines the uh, uh, alternatives of event relations as volitional or causal or probable. Okay. Oh, so the, the, the determinist paradigm. Okay. The, the, uh, yeah, but yeah, it's it, it, more broadly the scientific paradigm. And it's it's a mm-hmm. world view. I mean, it's it's whether you're a determinist or not, you only have a certain number of categories available by which one event can relate to another event. And those categories don't resolve the free will debate. They put you in a quandary in which you have a physical story and you have a mental story. You have a wave version of the universe and you have a particle version of the universe. You have relativity theory, and you have quantum mechanics, and the current paradigm of conceptual thinking and science can't put those together. So do we look for spiritual paradigms then? <laughs> or no? You could. Yeah, sure you could. I, I don't know if it's asking the same question, but it, it, it could be. In other words, you, you could separate spiritual questions from questions about um, science and determinism and all that. And then in other ways of defining God and spirituality, they're, they're intimately related. And in other theories, they're completely compatible. Mm-hmm. You the feel like it's not a... science and soul, as, as one philosopher put it. Right. So are, do you feel like um, it was just a matter of the way you were raised? You just feel like it wasn't it doesn't fit into these questions because I think you could still answer not even just like from the traditional Western God point of view. I'm talking about even other traditions that are, you know, talking about these concepts of how reality was created, um, what, how, what that looked like and um, the nature of reality. And so, yeah, I think a lot of what we've talked about here on the universe game is 
partly some of those spiritual traditions and how they saw things. And so, yeah, that was always one one thing that I would love to understand more as to, you know, why a lot of scientists are not really open to some of these other spiritual answers to these questions, you know? Is it basically because we can't measure them scientifically? My understanding is that the great physicists of the ages were all uh, uh, spiritual and religious and uh, Einstein was and Schrodinger and Bohr and all the guys who founded quant I don't know all the guys but the main ones there's a book yeah. I have somewhere on my my shelf which which has just quotes from the greatest scientists of all time and 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 including those guys and and Heisenberg and all and they're all spiritual and they all talk about God and they don't see any conflict between the two. Mm -hmm. uh, um, but as you say, I think there's truth in what you're saying. I mean, that's a set of the top minds of the ages. But 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 you're absolutely right. There is a conflict in this purely scientific, physical, materialistic framework and spirituality. No question about that. I just wouldn't yeah. lay it the the the, the uh, you know top level of physicists or what have you who seem to be either mystics or you know, um, uh, believers in, in a ultimate spiritual being or ultimate spiritual reality. And they don't find that incompatible with studying the laws of how physical reality works. Yeah, how do you feel about like the comparison to some people say that there's a quantum field, right? Quantum field there. And some people compare that to like the Tao or to God, that maybe God is potentials or something like that. Have you ever thought about that? Yeah, but I I have, but we're talking about sort of two different things. Okay. Um, uh, you know, I, I I've I've talked about before the fact that people read all kinds of things into quantum science, which is you know quantum field theory and so forth. You know, and and you you can graft onto quantum science whatever conceptual layer you want to. But you're grafting onto something that's looking at physical events and has no idea the nature of the matter it's looking at and doesn't know whether they're operating under probabilistic or deterministic, or you could even say volitional or teleological laws. And that's quantum science right now, the state of quantum science. All these theories saying all different kinds of things, some compatible with free will, some not. Some saying the nature of the universe is this, some saying the nature of the universe is that. So that's the science part of it. And I, I would separate that from, you know, claims that, you know, Deepak Chopra like, like claims that because quantum science has shown that the world is governed by probability, which it hasn't, as I, you know, explained this, this conflict in the theories and the, the way of particle structure and so forth. Uh, but because it's all probability, therefore, and, you know, whatever, you can put it on. But, but then you're entering a realm that's outside of uh, uh, quantum mechanics. Because quantum mechanics doesn't talk about that stuff. It talks about the nature of particle relations and fields and so forth. Does that make sense? Mm -hmm. So, so yeah, I don't... Yeah, combine I them, though? <laughs> I, pardon me? Could we combine them, though? <laughs> Eventually? You know? Wouldn't that well, be the hope yeah, to kind of fit it all together? Said, that's the thing. That's the thing. That new paradigm that I'm saying we don't have would be combining them in a, in a large sense because if you could integrate consciousness or some, for lack of better words, let's call it just to oppose it to the world of physical events, just as, you know, some sort of spiritual, non-physical force, okay? If you could figure out how to combine those in a paradigm that allowed each of, them to exist, um, you'd, you'd be making a huge step before in, to integrating spiritual issues into uh, the world of physical phenomena. They would no longer be separate. They, they, would, they would have intrinsic interactions. And then you're, you're more like talking about what we think of as two things you may be talking about as one thing in the next paradigm. And it becomes a whole different perspective. I mean, part of the reason why we're having grappling with these issues that you're raising is because we don't have that paradigm that's going to give us the answer. And maybe there never will be one. 
But what I'm saying is that there isn't one right now, or we wouldn't have been struggling for so long. And you wouldn't have famous physicists saying nobody has a clue about what quantum science means. If you think you understand it, you don't, or something like that. Exactly. Well, it, that, yeah, I was paraphrasing <laughs> the famous Feynman quote exactly. I like the other one that people don't mention as often. He says something like, uh, quantum science is so difficult to understand that I don't even know if there's a problem. <laughs> something like that. It's so yeah. com- it, you know, so complicated. Quantum science is so complicated that I don't even know if there's a problem. That's my favorite final quote. Woo! But where I come from, where I'm coming from in terms of my <laughs> exploration, Nick, is more like a bunch of claims are being made about reality. We're determined. There's no basis for those claims. They are based, they're, and when I say no basis, that's a pretty strong statement. I can go on and tell you why. In addition to all the things I said, and people, prominent people in public positions are going out there and saying silly things that aren't true. One of the silly things they say is that these neurological studies that started in the 80s with Benjamin Libet prove that, I think in Harris's words, quote, our brains make our decisions for us before we're even aware of what we're going to do next. And none of the tests say that, and none of the tests provide data for that, none of the tests endorse that theory. And there's a slew of tests that say, that ain't the case. There's all kinds of problems with that and those tests. And the three tests that Harris cites don't say that. They don't say what he says. The one that comes closest was repudiated by the very author of the test based on subsequent tests. So uh, you have people saying things, I guess it's a conventional wisdom, that just aren't true. I was listening to a lecture the other day and Daniel Dennett throws out something about these tests and just as if they're gospel. When in fact the tests prove that there's no causal relationship that we can find between these neural signals and you know, simple motor movements. And I could, I, I could give you 18 reasons why the tests don't say that, but the bottom line is, don't trust me, you or your audience, go look up Benjamin Libet in Wikipedia. It will show almost all the tests that criticize and amplify his stuff. Click on them and go read the conclusions, and there isn't a study that endorses neural brain determinism. Some stronger than others say it's possible, it could be, this is some evidence, blah, blah, blah. None of them endorse it, and, and none of them find anything other than non-causal correlations. So there's just such these misconceptions out there. And so that, that, that's the point of view I'm sort of coming from. It's not really, how does this fit into the spiritual thing? It's let's debunk some of the silliness first. You know? Sure. Yeah, so you've got your book. And as a part of that book, I'm sure you have more reasons as to why determinism is false. Are there any that kind of stick out to you that you feel like are really strong at this moment? Well, besides the science, there's two or three, but, but, but for lack of time, the one I would pick is that determinism, determinism is self-contradictory. Determinist principles you know, violate their own terms, their, con- their contradictions. And the easiest way to, I think, to get into this is, is to take a very popular criticism of postmodernist thought and show you how it's, it's a contradiction. So postmodernism, right, various forms, in one way or another, say there is no truth. Truth is a power play or means of gaining power, or means of manipulation. And all kinds of critics jump up in their seats and say, wait a second, how can it be true that there's no truth? You are telling us something that you are claiming it's, that's true. You're making a truth claim. But on the other hand, you're saying that there's no truth. That invalidates your ability to make a truth claim about anything. So it's an inherent contradiction. And in saying there is no truth, you have to say something is true. It's true that there is no truth. So it's a self-contradictory claim. It's called a performative contradiction. It's a funny, uh, random, odd word for, for a simple thing, which is that certain claims you can't make. They make no sense. They contradict themselves. There is no truth, and I'm telling you that's true. Okay? Another example before we get to determinism 
is is Thomas Nagel argues against subjective subjective type philosophies. Everything is subjective, you know. And he says, "Well, wait a second. Then then what you're saying is subjective. If you want to get rid of any kind of objective measure of anything, okay. But then you've disqualified yourself from making a claim because everything you say is subjective by your own proposition." Another way, I think he says it somewhere, he says, you can't discredit reason or, or marginalize reason without using reason to do it. And so, so, so he doesn't call it the performer, but he, but he uses the, the problem with, with many, many prominent philosophies is they contradict themselves. Well, determinism is the same. There's a fundamental contradiction at the heart of determinism. Determinism is true. Oh, but I believe determinism is true because unthinking causal events force me to believe it. Determinism is true, but I believe it because I was caused to believe it. So, a determinist world is a world in which there is no truth. Our thoughts are attributable to physical forces, not to truth. There is no objective truth. Objective truth in a determinist universe is whatever we're causally compelled to believe is objective. So, like postmodernism, determinism is making a fundamentally contradictory and self-invalidating claim. It's saying all of our thoughts are determined. That means all of our thoughts are, are, ba are based on truth. Well, wait a second. That's wrong. That's not right. Well, if you're a determinist saying that, you have to say back to them, well, that was just another determined thought you're thinking. Okay, so what? Still not based on truth. And if a determinist says, well, wait a second, maybe the world was set up so that what I'm caused to believe true happens to correspond to what's true. Okay, that's according to determinism, your determinism, that's what you are determined to believe. Fine, you can believe that. So determinist claims uh, are nonsensical. You know, I, 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 I listened to Sapolsky last night give a lecture. He seems like such a nice guy, and he's so knowledgeable, and he's got such great lectures out there on, you know, evolutionary biology. They're just fantastic. But I hear him say these things on the free will debate uh, about, like, like, you know, well, we don't determine anything. We don't determine. Well, it's, it's all our neurons and our this and that. And I go, well, then, so, Robert, Robert my chum, that means that all those things just caused, prompted you to say that. So why should I believe you? Noam Chomsky has a good way of saying the, the performative contradiction that I quoted in the book, and this is a very loose paraphrase of, of the contradiction at the heart of determinist principles. He says something like, if you really believe in determinism, why are you up there trying to convince people the world is determined? You can't convince them. Their thoughts have already been determined. You don't have reason at your disposal because what you think is reasonable is what causal forces have made you think is reasonable. So what are you doing up there? You better, why don't you go see a, he says, why don't you go see a ball game? <laughs> That's it right there. <laughs> That's it right there. It's like, if you're going to say that it's true, there is no truth, you know, let's go see a ball game. So, where I'm coming from is that's the kind of thing, that's one of the pillars of determinist misconceptions. It makes no sense. They, they take away their own right to say, it's true, the world is determined. Because they're also saying our thoughts aren't under our control. They're caused by physical events. They were predestined. What they should be saying is, I was predestined to be, a, they should go to a, a, I don't know, alcoholics, a determinist anonymous. And they should say, raise their hands and go, my name is uh, David. I was predetermined to be a determinist. I, I, I was made to believe that determinism is true. And I tell people determinism is true, even though uh, what I really think is that all of our beliefs come from physical events. But I'm working on the problem, and I hope to recover from it. Um, and thank you very much. And people, other determinists, cl uh, uh, you know, uh, clapped and uh, for being so courageous. Um, 
And that's what I felt when I was listening to Sapolsky's presentation. You're saying it all comes from neural synapses firing, but that means yours are firing, and that's why you say it. So that's sort of the, the other big, you know, you asked for another big kind of area that discredits uh, determinist thinking, which is you can't be a determinist and say anything is true, because that violates determinism. Nothing is true but what your physical events cause you to believe. Then everything would be subjective. <laughs> and then we just go in circles. Everything would then be subjective, and then we just go in circles. It is circles. It is circles. Uh, you know, Harris's definition of what would you have to have to, to have free will? He said we have to, paraphrase, we'd have to know about and control all the factors that determine us. Now, wait a second. There's something circular there. In what you're saying, in order to have free will, we'd have to not be determined. Okay, all right. Most free will <laughs> ethics would get would would agree to that. But the kind of the question is leapfrogged over, which is: Are we determined by all those forces? Or are we influenced by them? And that's another another big area. But but in a nutshell, I don't know how much time we have. But but but. Determinists are constantly forgetting to make a distinction between control and influence. So every time Sapolsky or Harris or any number of them get up there and say, well, we don't control our genetics, we don't control our biology, we don't control our neurophysiology, we didn't choose our parents, we didn't choose our upbringing, you know, the time and the era we were born, we don't control any of that stuff. And under the free will paradigm, you'd say, so what? Those are conditions. Those are the conditions on which free will operates. Their limitations, their boundaries, their influences. They don't control us. You have to make a distinction between things that influence us and limit us and set boundaries within which there's prerogatives. That's not the same as control. And and um, and in fact, uh, determinists have it exactly backwards. Free will needs to have boundaries and constraints and limits. I mean, what's going to provide the alternatives? Reality, uh, reality has to be structured in order for free will to operate. It only has options because there's boundaries and limits that set the options in circumstances. You couldn't have free will in a vacuum. So it's the exact opposite of what Sapolsky and the other people say. You know, you, you need genetics, you need a foundation, you need a bodily platform to run free will, you know? You need some software to run the keystrokes, you know? And, and, and that doesn't mean they control us. It means that in the free will paradigm, it means that they're, they're conditions of influence. And if you want to be a determinist and make your case, instead of over and over saying, well, in order to have free will, you'd have to be determined, and we're not determined, and that's not an argument, and that's not evidence, hello. You'd have to show why uh, all of what they call factors of control aren't factors of influence or conditions, and they never talk about that. They assume, when, when, whenever Sapolsky says, um, well, where did that come from? You know, you're angry at your father, and so you're a rebel, but where did that come from? Your genes and your biology and your... The mother is, uh, you know, breastfeeding or not breastfeeding, all that kind of stuff. But where did that come from? Presumes that it was determined. Okay, and you decided to to reach for the toaster and and put it on, you know, whatever. Where did that come from? Well, the neurons fired, da 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 da. You know. So it's uh, the question. The way he asks the question repeatedly. You could say anything you want. You could say, well, you know, I met God last night with a burning bush. Where did that come from? Or I discovered this, where did that come from? And he will attribute it to a causal source. So the where did I come from is not an argument. And these aren't examples of determinism. These are presumptions of determinism and, and uh, posing as arguments or evidence. Well, yeah, if you assume that we're determined, we don't have free will. I, I could sign off on that. Wow. Did I did I um, did I say anything that was confusing or that you'd like no, to? I, 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 mean, like, I am just I'm taking that in. You I, know, you know it, it's hard because I'm distilling a, a lot of study 
and mm -hmm. in which I had to throw out so much misinformation that led me down the wrong path. And it's like, wait a second, really quantum physics is doesn't know probable universe. I thought, why are you saying it doesn't Deepak saying it, you know, so it, it, it's, it's, it's really hard to find one place where you can get sort of a big picture grasp on that, you know? So I realize when I throw this stuff out there, it's a lot, of, it's based on synthesizing a lot of information. And it's also things that people don't talk about that should, as at the beginning, I said, they should be part of the free will debate. You know, how are you going to explain that physical stuff following the laws of physics forms complex conceptual frameworks? You know, how do you explain that you can leapfrog over the fact that we don't know matter and we don't know what consciousness is, but we do know that we don't have free will, the fundamental attribute of consciousness, which we don't or not, that we don't know. No, this is some reason this is not part of the free will debate. The preparative contradiction, the contradiction at the heart of determinism isn't discussed in debates about free will. Noam Chomsky might mention it if someone asks him a question or Ken Wilbur in some offhanded way. And maybe there's some others I haven't seen. You know, maybe your listeners can point some more out. I'd love to read more about people who, who have really, you know, nailed this performative contradiction thing. They have when it comes to postmodernism, but I mean in the context of, you know, determinist arguments. Yeah. Yeah, so I think what's coming up for me is actually something you said earlier I'd just like to touch on. There was a, I think you were saying that most of the theories of quantum physics that are prevalent, I think the top three you said, are one of them has a possibility for free will. And I just like to even explore that more because I just really, I didn't know that. So if you could like explain that a little bit more detailed as to how probable, how, how is a theory deterministic? What makes like pilot wave theory deterministic or, yeah. You know. Well, as I'm not a physicist or a mathematician, but as I understand it from those who are, the pilot wave theory is that there's always a wave in a particle and the wave guides the particle under a, a guidance equation. It's, it's additional equation to the deterministic Schrodinger equation. So you have two equations, one governing the system and one the operation of the system, and, and that's both a wave and a particle. And they obey uh, this pilot wave equation, which is deterministic. That's, th that, that's how I understand it. Now, a lot of people don't believe there's a, 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 a wave in a, a, a particle. And how does the wave guide the particle? And how does, you know, it's, there's yeah, so many... What makes it deterministic right there? slits and kind of things. Sorry? So what makes that deterministic? You say, so that makes it deterministic. Well, the... The, uh, the, 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 the equation? The, the, yeah, yeah. The, the equation predicts with whatever, 100% certainty or close to it, the evolution of the system follows this this equation. Okay. So if this is the state of the system, you plug in the, the, the equations, and this is going to be the next state of the system. And you plug in the equations, and this is going to be the next state of the system. So right. in that sense, a, determin a, a, a physicist describe it as a deterministic system based on two uh, uh, you know, uh, uh, deterministic equations, the, 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 the central quantum equation, the Schrodinger equations, plus this pilot guidance equation by which the waves sweep up and tell the particles where to go. Because um, mm. otherwise, I mean, I mean, you know, you, you, you know the famous double slit experiment to some degree, right? I mean, yeah. particles can't go into both holes and form a wave pattern, and yet somehow they do. They do when we're not looking. We're looking at them. They form a particle clump pattern like particles. And so the pilot wave idea, and, and, and one reason particles can't end up looking like waves is because they can only go through one or the other slit at a time, and you have to go through both at the same time to create interference and fan out and land as a, a wave. So the, the, the pilot wave theory resolves that in a big conceptual, big picture conceptual sense by saying, no, it's a, waves and particles are going through in a sense, and one's guiding the other. And because you wonder if it's particles, how do they know where to land? How can they land on each of those bands? You know, it's just a particle being shot through. And there's nothing that suggests that they shouldn't land straight opposite the hole that they go through. And that's how they, what they do when you look at them. But when you don't look at them, 
they form this wave pattern and ha that they don't have to know where to go. <laughs> so the, the pilot wave theory says, well, they don't have to know where to go because what's going through is a wave and particles and one's guiding the other. Interesting. So that's, that's called deterministic. The one that's probabilistic is the GRW and, and spontaneous collapse theories. Um, and then, and that's usually described as probabilistic because the wave function collapses and it collapses. Uh, th th that's a word that's used for the transition, quote unquote, if you believe it exists in your quantum theory of preference, where suddenly these waves uh, become particles. And, and um, the GRW theory says that in a probabilistic equation, just after a certain period of time and under certain conditions they collapse and you you get particles and so ultimately you know this is shower of particles is is, is what we see going on and it's probabilistic okay yeah that that answers the question <laughs> that, and, that uh, two best guys to really listen to and it, it really it, i think would help anybody straighten things out because there's so much craziness about there about quantum theory is tim maudlin Okay, who's one of the only guys who just talks about the top theories and here's what they are and here's how they work and all of that. Um, and um, David Alpert, who's an associate of his, who have terrific guests on podcasts when they explain the foundations of quantum theory. You, you get as clear of a sense as you can from, a non, from an amateur, non-physicist, not mathematics sense. Uh, of how these things are. And until I listened to their stuff, I was more than confused. However confused I might be now, I was far more confused before I, I saw their stuff. And they're terrific. They're just the best, clearest, straightforward language explainers of the different, the, the most talked about quantum theories and their problems. Hmm. Very interesting. Okay, I've got... So this is those guys, if you ever, I mean, if you want to clarify and from my fuzziness about why they're probabilistic or determinist and listen to these guys, honestly, you, you, you'll go, whoa, I finally get it. I mean, I think you gave a great explanation. It, it definitely answered the question in my mind. So, yeah, now we're on the Universe Game Podcast, so I want to just ask you, in your opinion, I know you can't prove anything, but do you feel like there's a chance or what is your perception? Have you seen any evidence yourself, whether that's, you know, evidence experiential in your life or maybe that's, you know, in the equations or the science? Do you feel like there's any thing you've discovered that maybe could lead you to the conclusion in some part that the universe might be a game of some sort, whether that's like a video game, whether it's simulation, there's different takes on it, but I'm just curious as to your thoughts. Well, tell, tell me what you mean, what the essence of what you're thinking when you use the, the word game. What does that mean? Yeah. Yeah, so for me, the when I started this podcast years ago, I had played a lot of video games growing up, and that was a, just a part of my life. And I started to see that reality seemed to have game-like qualities, kind of like a there were things that I noticed about reality that could lead to the conclusion that our reality might be a form of a game or a, fo a form of a virtual reality, so to speak. And with the universe, the game conclusion, it's not a determined universe. It's not like universe, the movie. It's more, you know, it's, 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 it's a type of experience where we may come in to this game or this, um, uh, this particular environment that has conditions in which we can do things that we want to do with our free will, essentially. Is he? Is he? So, yeah. Well, I think I think that looking at the universe as a game is the most likely uh, candidate uh, for what it is. Uh, as as you're describing it, it it. it, it it's the most likely candidate. I mean, again, I think we really do need a, another way of looking at the world, another paradigm. But pending that, determinism doesn't work for many of the reasons I gave and many others that we can't get, or some others that we can't get into, and it's contradictory, and it can never be proven, and I, we could go on about that. But So that's not a good candidate. Uh, a probabilistic universe has the same problems. If if I say the universe is probable, then I'm saying that that thought was probable, and now I'm in that same circle of contradiction. 
And then what are the other candidates? Well, we don't know. There is no answer. And, or, or there is and we don't know it, which is sort of my inkling of the new paradigm kind of shift, thinking that that's really if there's going to be an answer. And until then, the best candidate is we're living in a game where we have limits and boundaries and obstacles from whatever source, the Big Bang or a spiritual source or some combination, because there may, we may, it may turn out that there's, there's not a difference in the way that our paradigm thinks there's a difference. And we're playing that game, and we're playing it with uh, something that isn't purely physical. That, but it is part of the laws of physics in the sense of the natural order. You know, that again, to come back to that other thing, I don't know if I finished the thought, but three, free will violates the natural order. And I would say, well, we don't know what that is because we don't have a complete laws of physics, and we have these contradictory physics. But the reverse is saying that if free will exists and if reality is a game, then it will be part of the laws of physics, just that we don't know what those laws are yet. But free, if free will exists, it, it has to be part of the laws of physics. It's happening here in, in this universe, as are all the physical stuff. And so the presumption that, 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 that free will can't be part of the laws of physics or that it can't be a game, right, is just presuming we're determined, I mean, it, for which there's no evidence and it's contradictory. So to go back to your question, the game metaphor is the best, most viable candidate that we have because these others are disqualified from running, <laughs> except for that maybe there's no answer or we haven't yet found it. Um, does that make sense? I, 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 yeah. I mean, what else is the universe? You can't, you, you can't prove free will. Some right people now. say it's a dream. Well, okay. If it's a dream, then they're dreaming. What they just told you was a dream. So don't, don't buy into ever again, I don't mean don't, it's in the scolding sense, in the sense of, of knowledge sense, the next person who says it's a dream will say, well, I guess that that was your dream. There's nothing truthful to what you just said. It was just part of your dream. Nonsense. You say you're not saying anything true by saying it's part of your dream. You're saying you're dreaming that, 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 that free will is nonsense. Well, great. Enjoy your dream. But don't, <laughs> don't fall for the... The circular, nonsensical self-invalidation of claims like this. And that's really what, what, what I'm trying to say. And what do you have left? You have a game. You have a game. We don't know the force that's playing the game or where it comes from, you know, or how we navigate that game, but we are. At least that's the most likely way to look at reality in the absence of a better candidate, a candidate that doesn't contradict itself, at least saying, I think we have free will is not a contradiction. Saying we, ha we are determined, or even I think we might be determined is a contradiction because it's saying that all my thoughts might be invalidated, but I don't know. So, so, so I, think it's, I, I think it's a great metaphor that you have. I, I think it's the most likely and plausible one until some way comes along that reconciles them. And when they reconcile them, I think it'll still be a game because you're not taking out the, you know, the play component, right? The right. whether you call it spiritual or mental or uh, you know consciousness, whatever you want to call it, it's it's going to have to be a part of the new paradigm because otherwise you're back in the same self contradiction of everything is determined and including that thought that I just said. So I think it. I, I think I, I'm totally in sync with your, your your vision, if that makes sense for for all kinds of those reasons. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that makes a lot of sense. That's I really appreciate your perspective on that. So I've got one more question for you. By the way, and, Determinist has a competing podcast to yours. Your, yours is called The Universe Game. I'm sorry. Uh, Universe the Game. Yep. Universe the Game. So um, it, it, the competing Determinist podcast is called uh, Determinist the, Ca the Game, but I don't really know because it's, <laughs> it's what I said was determined. <laughs> Hey man, I'm, I'll go on there. I'll debate. Yeah, I'll debate. <laughs> Let's I'll, go. I'll uh, bring me along for the party. Yeah, I'm happy, happy to be probably, invited. I'll probably meet Sam Harris at one point. Would you be open to um, doing a sit down with him and talking about free will? Yeah, of course, of course. I okay. was uh, I was thinking uh, uh, recently. I, I should probably write him at some point, whether he knows about the book or not, and say, hey, you know, I've written this thing and totally confidentially between us. We'll sign a confidentiality agreement. 
I think you've got to modify the way you're presenting this thing. We can disagree about the conclusion, but you got to talk about the science tests in the right way, and you got to fill in the full landscape and not talk about some tests that don't say it's indisputable. And you have to deal with these questions that you're not dealing with. I, I, I mean, just, you know, just privately, I don't care. I don't care if I'm ever on your show or whatever, but I'm saying privately, confidentially, you really have to address these things or you've not given a full, you haven't fully addressed the issues. Anyway, mm -hmm. that's, that's just a, an aside I was thinking of lately. Sure. You yeah, know? I hope that happens because we need to be able to communicate with each other and go if off nothing ideas. Else, if nothing else, if, if he read it, it, it would put his, it, 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 his educated and, and very impressive mind into answering some really important questions that, that, that's being left out of the debate. You know? All right. You hear that, Sam? <laughs> Read the book. <laughs> but, uh, but yeah, so, okay, one more question for you today. Now, let's say I know you think that Many Worlds is disastrous, but let's say that Many Worlds, let's, let's take a hypothetical for a second, that it's true, and you realize that you actually are going to move on from this universe in some wacky, weird way. And this was the last time that you were going to be able to talk to the humans in this universe. What do you think is the first thing that comes to your mind is the message you want to leave humanity with? Oh, wow. I didn't think you were going there. I, I was trying to think of all the... <laughs> what is the, the, the Many Worlds theory is a contradiction, too, because if you say, if you say let's assume the Many Worlds theory is true. Well, hold on a second. You're only assuming it. You can only assume it for this universe, and you can only assume it for this moment, because the next time we do a measurement and outcome, we might find ourselves in a world in which the Many Worlds theory is, is, is it brings on a death sentence, you know, and only which is so, so, so you can't even say the Many Worlds theory is true. Okay, however, logical contradictions aside, so am I speaking to all the worlds or just the worlds that I've manifested in or continuing 5,000 times a second to manifest in? It's a lot of worlds. That one. That one. <laughs> that. Well, that, there's not one. <laughs> that was that, the last those, thing you said. Those 5,000 a second, those 5, yeah. a second that I'm, I'm manifesting in, in, in this way, anyway. <laughs> Uh, what was the question? The question is, well, what would I say? The question to... is very very simply, all right, let's just forget the rest. The question is, is, if you had one last message to humanity, what do you feel like is, is coming to you to say right now? Well, uh, you know, having been somewhat message. a child of the 60s, I could point to my T-shirt, as you know, is it peace, love, and understanding. But um, and another cliche, I suppose I could say, is uh, a lot of this journey in trying to understand the free will question is questioning authority, questioning conventional wisdoms. If you're going to get any truth out of the world, I'm I'm finding um, to my shock and dismay that you really have to question things that are just taken for granted. You know, whether it's the meaning of causation or the state of science or what forms a coherent truth proposition. You're just throwing out. I mean, you just have to question things. You can't take them on their face value because most of what you hear uh, doesn't pan out. And you have these guys, uh, these mainstream determinists going on and saying things that simply aren't true about science or, or, or much of a lot of other things. So I guess that would be my, my message besides peace, love, and understanding. It would be the, the other 60s sort of slogan, which was question authority. Think for yourself. And there Play it the, is. Play the game. Play the game. For yourself. Be, be your own player. How's that? In, in, in the, 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 the vocabulary of your uh, podcast, be your own player. Don't play somebody else's game. Excellent. All right, David <laughs> Lawrence. Our slogan. The, uh, there it is. There it is. <laughs> Thanks for coming be, on, man. Be I, um, the player that you can be. There it is. Yes. Fantastic. Hey, thanks so much, uh, Nick. This this, this uh this was fun. It went off into all kinds of fun directions. Uh, That's it. about usually about how it goes. I like to keep it unique. But uh, yeah, so in terms of you've got your book, right? And where can people find your book on Amazon? Correct? I think I saw it on Amazon. On Amazon, on the website. I have some additional material, biochemicalrobots.com. 
Sure. Is there any anything else you got going on you want to share with people well, in particular? Um, just no, not really. Podcasts. I've been thinking about an idea for something new, but it, it hasn't. I haven't decided if I want to devote the time and energy to go down that road. I mean, it's it, it's again, there's a lot of stuff you have to sort the wheat from the chafe or the chafe from the wheat, whichever direction it may be. Uh, and it's it, it's it's a big devotion of time. So I haven't figured out really what if what the next big project would be. Um, All right. Although I have some ideas, but Excellent. Again, it, it's it's the same kind of a game, which is is trying to figure out something in the midst of all kinds of misinformation and conventional wisdoms and half truths. And by the way, I'm not. This is not to accuse anybody of being deceptive or half truths. It's just what they're saying isn't accurate. There's lots, a lot of reasons for that. I tend to gravitate towards, well, almost all the physicists, like like Brian Green. You ask him about free will, and he says, look, I think the world is determined, but I could be wrong. And tomorrow, we could find out that the, that, that we have free will, because the laws of physics are, are very incomplete, and you can't rule it out. And that's, you know, that's a major acclaimed, uh, you know, visible, super smart physicist who's basically saying what I said earlier. It's too. It's premature to know, given the state of science and the laws of physics and and human knowledge. So there are people out there like that who are who are playing. I think the most rational game that we can play, which is that there's just too many factors we don't know yet. Um. So that's that's that 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 I'd like to play that in another, you know, in another realm to answer your question in a different kind of a question. Hmm. And I want to start a podcast called um, the Determinist Universe Game. dot com. I mean, I mean, podcast. And I'll have you on as a guest. <laughs> there you go, man. All right. Well, think, thanks again. How do you know whether what you're thinking is true? Because I don't know whether anything I'm thinking is true. This is called Determinist World Game. All you can do is just make decisions <laughs> and illusory be able to or accept not. illusory or not as they may be right but that's that's what it seems as though we're here to do in my in my take is just we're here to make decisions and we're here to create with those decisions and sometimes those things that we create with those decisions are not what we intended but we move on and we continue persevere until we um until we self-realize, maybe, if we want to take a spir spiritual sense or until we um, move on from this game. But uh, all right. Thank you again, man, for coming on. And uh, we will have all your links in the description for your book. Check out his book. And we will see you next time on Universe Game. And until then, peace.